I'd like to welcome to the show John August, the legendary John August. Thank you so much for being on the show, sir. Pleasure to be here, Alex. You are, as they say, an OG in the podcasting space, uh, without question. When did you actually start your podcast? Well, we're on episode 405. We just recorded that last night. Um, so it's six or seven years, a long, long time. And what made you start podcasting when like nobody was podcasting? You know, I started a blog when nobody was blogging too. I've just always, you know, I always look to see sort of what the, the next thing is that's interesting to me. And, and I see people doing the thing and I want to do it. And so I had started to listen to a bunch of tech podcasts and mm-hmm. um, I was getting really tired of sort of kind of the grind of, of the monologue of doing a blog for screenwriting. And mm-hmm. so I turned to Craig Mazin, who was doing a blog like it. And so like, let's just have this be a conversation. So we started a weekly conversation at Script Notes and uh, it's gone really well. It's been going ever since, very strong. So uh, now I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you first get into the business? Um, I started, I went through film school. I went through USC for film school mm-hmm. and graduated from that. I'd written a script that people liked. It was not a movie that was ever gonna get made, but it sort of got me started meeting around town. Um, first project I got hired to write on was an adaptation of How to Eat Fried Worms, a kid's book yeah. uh, for Ron Howard's company. And I just kept working. And first movie I got made was Go. That was back in 99, so 20 years ago. And uh, just kept going. That was a very complex script, if I remember. A complex movie. There was so many story yeah. plots jumping back and forth. And I remember when that came out, was in the, and it was definitely a 90s movie. such a Doug Lyman 90s film without question. How did you interweave so many plots and like matching them all together and stuff at the end like yeah, it, Go started, it, it started as a short um a script for a short film which mm-hmm. was just the first section of it and then i had all those other characters in there and i knew what they were doing the rest of that night and rather than try to fill out the, the whole story from within i just make it longer i just restarted the story twice and um could sort of follow the same night from different characters perspectives and you see how they overlap um and luckily you know, Pulp Fiction had come out a year before then, so people had an understanding like, okay, that's a real thing you're allowed to do in movies. <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, God bless that. But it, it, it let us do some very specific things because so often you see movies that are struggling because, you know, the audience wants the next thing to happen, but the story needs something else to happen. And right. this could be very tight because the storylines could stick very close together. Now, how many screenplays did you have written when you sold your first one? Because I, I always tell people, don't just have one. <laughs> yeah. Don't write, don't, don't sell your first screenplay generally. Um, you know, I hadn't sold a written script until Go, which was pretty far into it. So I'd written four things before I had one that sold. Mm-hmm. But two of those things I'd... Um, written, I'd, I'd been paid to write. They were adaptations of existing books. So I was very lucky. It started very quickly for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but your general advice, I think, is correct, is that you don't put everything in. Don't assume that the one thing you're working on right now is the thing that's going to break through for you because you just don't know. And you're still learning your craft. You, you can't anticipate all these things that are going to happen. That said, you know, write the movie you wish you could see because that's the movie that you're going to actually stick by and finish and really be able to, you know, stay home on Friday nights to work on. And you, you, you came up in the nineties. So the, yeah. the, the screenwriting marketplace was a little bit different back then. The, uh, well, there, there were, there were truly were spec sales. There would be like, you know, a million dollar spec sale for, uh, you know, an original script. And that has basically all gone away. And so that was different. It was, uh, it was a boom time. There were, there clearly were things that were happening there. The same way that there's it's a boom time right now for television. It's just it's shifted a lot. Yeah, because because back then, I mean, you would get these Joe Esterhouse, Shane Black deals that would just yeah. like two, three million dollar for me. It was like a lottery almost. Yeah. And yeah. and someone like Esterhouse, he I think he made more money on movies that never got made. Yeah. <laughs> than he did. Yeah, and but I mean, that's always been true of screenwriting, though. Is that mm-hmm. you know there are a lot of screenwriters who get hired a lot and they work a lot, but you know most movies that are developed don't get made, and so. Um, that is a frustration of screenwriting is that even me, like I've been, I have a pretty good track record, but most of the things I've written have not been made. And that's a real frustration. And you've actually been, hi- and these are things that you're hired to do. You've been to hired, do re- yeah. So I, mean, I, have, I have like 12 produced credits, but I have at least 30 scripts that I've written to, you know, for pay. And most of them are just kind of frozen in 12 point courier just because, you know, either the underlying rights or just whatever didn't come together the right way to make those movies. Yeah, it is a frustrating part of of the whole the whole game, and 
And then there's multiple reasons for that. It could be yeah. rights or something like that, or just studio uh, changes. <laughs> Absolutely. You never found the right director, or there was a competing project that was too similar. Lots of reasons why things don't happen. Now, you've collaborated with uh, the legendary Tim Burton on multiple occasions. What is a collaboration process like with Tim Burton? Yeah, you know, it's collaborating between a screenwriter and a director is different every time. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's a really close bond, and I'm there every moment. So, like for Go, I was there for every frame we shot. You know, I was in the editing room a lot, I was there for the whole thing. With Tim, it's not that. I'm with Tim. I'm very much like a department head, and my department is story. And so I'm the person who's coming up with a script, delivering the script, and then I largely go away. I'll be there through pre-production, through table read. I'm there to help for anything that needs help, but like during production, I have no function in it. I'll see early cuts. I can give notes on that. I can give feedback, but uh, it's that's just not how we work. He treats, you know, all his department heads really, really well, and so Colin Atwood, you know sees his vision, delivers costumes that will suit what he needs to do. The cinematographers do the same thing, but um, I'm, I'm a different department head uh, for Tim Burton movies. Do you actually, do, do, like when you're actually collaborating with him st with stories, do you just, he's just like, here's this, here's the book, get me something, or does he, does he give you notes, goes back and forth? It's more the former, so, we, which is unlike most directors, but it's really just, this is the overall vision, give me something that matches the vision. So Charlie and Chocolate Factory is a good example of that. He w had signed on to direct it. Um, it was really starting from zero on a script. And we could talk, he could say like, I want everything from the book and as much else as you need to make sense. And I could approach it then from my whole memory of how much I loved that book and sort of what was special to me about that book. Mm -hmm. And then write it really anticipating the things that he would love. And so you know, Wonka's father being a dentist and the orthodontic headgear and like just the moments I knew that Tim Burton could knock out of the park. Um, but there were probably less than an hour's conversation during the whole process of just like this, like what movie are we making? It was very clear that like, you know, I'm writing a script and Tim's making a movie and it'll, it'll work. And, and that's a very a unique scenario. Normally directors are really up all inside your business, Absolutely. as they say. <laughs> yeah, normally you're really sort of grappling over every scene and every every beat, and that's not Tim's basic um, way of doing things. His, you know, a thing I've really learned from him is that uh, he prepares meticulously, and so he has big notebooks of how he's going to do every scene, and he's sketching and he's painting, and he's figuring out what it is, but he's figuring out how to make the movie inside his head, and he doesn't, um, he doesn't necessarily need to work with me as a writer in terms of doing that. He's, he's, he's trusting me to sort of like provide the words and he's going to provide, you know, all the other things it takes to make a movie. I mean, you wrote one of my favorite Tim Burton movies ever, Big Fish, which Thank I think you. it was, it was such a brilliant, brilliant movie and, and very Tim Burton-y, but not in the same sense. Does that make sense? It does. Well, and that was a script that I'd written before Tim had signed on. So I, just read I read a book that I loved very much. I convinced the studio to buy me the book, and uh, I wrote it without any directors on board, without any producers on board. I just wrote the movie I, I wish I could see. Um, originally, Steven Spielberg had signed on to direct it. He was on for about a year. It never really happened. Um, and then when he dropped off, Tim signed on, and uh, so we didn't have a lot of conversation about, you know, the story, the movie, or sort of what individual things meant to him. He just he wanted to direct that script. And so the only things I changed once Tim signed on board were really for budget and schedule things, just like things that were in the script that just, we just couldn't make. And so then we discussed how we were going to do that, but it wasn't a, you know, you think that there's going to be these, you know, 12 hour sessions where we're going to really just mull over everything. And that's just not Tim's way. Now you, um, you, you have a, a recent film that just hit the theaters, um, mm -hmm. a small little film called Aladdin, uh, yes, a, <laughs> a, a small indie project, yeah. a small indie project by a startup. And, uh, and you know, I, I was, when I first heard they were, well, of course, this is remaking everything they ever have in their, in their arsenal or in their backlog. But when I heard about Aladdin, I'm like, wow, that's a really unique challenge because the, the original is so ingrained in our head and specifically that Robin yeah. Williams performance. How did you tackle that remake? Like, how did you go into that process knowing that there's this, honestly, this shadow? I'm sure Will Smith had the same problem. Yeah. The shadow of that Robin Williams was casting on the pro a project, at least from my point of view. Yeah, I, I approached it from, so we have to wind back the clock. Um, 
a lot of them sort of come into my universe once before, and it's like, oh no, I'm not going to touch that. <laughs> and then uh, Disney did the Cinderella remake, which right. I thought was fantastic. And mm -hmm. what I look, loved so much about the Cinderella remake is it took the same story, basically, and just gave the characters human motivations rather than cartoon motivations. That they really had to do things that flesh and blood people would do, not animated characters would do. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and those reasons had to be different. Um, and so as I approached the story from that perspective, um, I was looking at, well, Jasmine. And so Jasmine as a character, um, you just can't bring that animated character through the live action movie because she will seem so helpless and weak and frustrating to watch. And so you know, the idea that Jasmine is trying to learn how to rule this kingdom is interesting. That's a, a fundamental shift I could make from the very first pitch. Mm -hmm. The dynamic between Genie and um, Aladdin, I really saw them more as as bros, as like as pals. Like you've never had a friend like me. And so, what if it was more sort of a kind of a Seth Rogeny kind of dudes hanging out kind of vibe between them, rather than the Robin Williams cocaine uncle kind of thing? And <laughs> when and when you. you from the early pitches, like that's really the vibe I was going for. And so I knew that whoever was playing the genie, it wasn't Will at that point, but it was, it was hopefully going to be Will or somebody like Will, could, didn't have to play in the same lane. That he could do his own thing, that there wouldn't be that assumption that you have to have the same kind of manic energy at every point. It could be a, a different thing. Um, so that you know the characters were going through much the same story, but the reasons for how they were doing it were working a lot differently. Jafar is another good example is that he can't be as mustache twirly. Right. Um, he, he needs to be seen as a viable sort of physical threat and not just, you know, uh, obvious villain from the first moment he shows up. Right. Exactly. And, and that's what makes a good, that's what makes a good um, antagonist, generally yeah. speaking, is, is not the, the twirling mustaches has been, shouldn't really be what we yeah. write anymore. Now, Charlie's Angels, which was mm -hmm. uh, a monster hit when it came out, the first one, yeah. uh, for people was, when people that weren't around then, Charlie's Angels was a very big deal when it came out. And that was, that was your first kind of like blockbuster monster hit, right? Out of the gate. Yeah, it was the first one that I had sort of really come on board you know, at the start and sort of helped build from build up from the bottom. And that was, again, an example of, you know, taking all the things I loved about the original and right. recognizing, OK, so how do we do this as a movie? How does the things I love about this as a series, how do we do this in two hours? What are the audience expectations of how a story like this wants to tell itself in two, in two hours? Um, probably that and Big Fish sort of rival each other for the most difficult things I've written, because mm. in Charlie's Angels, you have three protagonists, each of whom need their own plot lines their own personal plot lines. You have a villain, you have a twist, you have all the sort of normal action movie, action comedy things that need to happen. So every scene has to do a lot of work to service very many things. And so um, making that all work together and the puzzle pieces fit was really tough. Um, but I, we approached it mostly from a sense of what do we want this movie to feel like? And so I really wanted to get that sense of being incredibly proud of the girls for sort of what they've done, which you don't think about in an action movie, but mm -hmm. um, these women are really, really good at what they do, but they're giant dorks when they're off the job. And so that's what makes them feel human and relatable is that they are, you know, they're goofy and flawed in ways that you can sort of key into. They're not perfect. Yeah, like you don't want to have a beer with Rambo, like generally no. speaking. <laughs> no, no, I mean, and comedies are never about cool people. Comedies are about dorks. And so I, we had to find a way that they could be great at their job, but also be dorks, you know, off the job. Now, what was it like, you know, being kind of like the bell of the of, of the ball after Charlie's Angels hits in town? Because anytime there's a big hit, the screenwriter yeah. and the director, they, they kind of get twirled around yeah. for and while, while you're hot, while the spotlight's on you. What's that, expre like, what that's, that, that experience like? Because I know a lot of people listening yeah. would love to know. Well, I mean... It's nice to be offered projects where you don't have to chase everything, where some things are just like, will come and say, like, hey, would you want to do this thing? That's great. You ultimately are constrained by time. Like, there's only so many things you can do, the only so many things you can say yes to. And the more things you say yes to, you're really saying no to other things. And it was tough to balance what people wanted me to do for them and those opportunities I was getting versus the things I wanted to do for myself and finding, you know, what was actually going to give, you know, provide value to me, creative satisfaction to me. Um, and I didn't always make the right choices. I ended up like, you know, taking projects that seemed cool, but sometimes never happened. And so there's, 
some gaps in my resume where I was working a lot, just those movies didn't happen. And a lot of my job as a screenwriter ends up being kind of like a stock picker. I have to pick the <laughs> movies that, um, that I want to do, but that I also think will get made because it doesn't do me a lot of good if I got paid to write a movie that never became a movie. Yeah, I know a lot of high end, you know, big time screenwriters that have one, maybe one credit to their, yeah. and they're like, but they're working for 10, 15 Constantly. years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, now, you also said at the beginning, you said that you, you kind of start off fast for you. What was the first break? Like, what was that first thing that happened? Because even in the 90s, it was still yeah. hard to break in without question. No, I, and I think this is, a, you know, a pattern I've noticed, you know, among my friends, but also I've had a, a whole slew of assistants who've grown up to be, you know, big writers. And there comes a moment at which something you've written is getting passed around without you are actively trying to get it passed around, where someone reads something and says, like, and pass it to someone's like, oh, you should read this, it's really good. And that happened for me with um, the script I wrote in film school, it was a, a romantic tragedy called Here and Now. And I read it now, and it's like, I, I don't think it's especially good, but the writing in it is good. You, you can read it and say like, oh, I don't necessarily wanna make this movie, but like the writer is actually probably pretty good and, and worth meeting. That got passed around a bunch. And just, you know, it started with friends at my level. So just, you know, people I was in class with, people who were assistants other places, would pass it around and their bosses would read it and eventually it sort of got some buzz to it. And that was what enabled me to, it got me to a producer who said he wanted to think about optioning it. I said, that's fantastic, um, but I really need an agent. Can you help me find an agent? And that producer helped me find my first agent and sort of get me more of those meetings. You end up doing sort of this water bottle tour of Los Angeles where you just <laughs> meet you know, you know, producers and studio executives and just talk about stuff. Now, um... What are some of the biggest mistakes you see in screen, in screen that screenwriters make when they first are starting out? Um, there's this focus on makeability, marketability, chasing what's currently popular, and that's mm -hmm. never going to work because, um, first off, everyone can sort of feel that you're not your heart's not really into that movie. Um, that like just because that western opened big, that there's not going to be a, a whole run on westerns. Um, it goes back to that kind of lottery ticket mentality and that like there was a time where scripts would sell and it's like you know suddenly you're a millionaire because that script sold for a bunch that's not the time we're living in really you need to be writing scripts that you deeply believe in it's a it's a movie that you would pay fifteen dollars to see opening weekend because it would mean that much so if that's a giant blockbuster or if that's a tiny art film write that movie you wish you could see because that's the thing people will read and say like oh he or she really you know I really see something special in this. I really see a connection to this. I want to meet this writer because mostly you're going to make your living as a screenwriter by being hired to do stuff. Now, what do you, I wanted to, I'd love to hear your opinion on this. You know, the studio system has changed so dramatically since the nineties or in the eighties where a movie like go could get made. Uh, yeah. But in today's world, the studio would never even think of making a film like go or an independent film, uh, not an independent film, but just like a little bit. Yeah, Go, Go was basically an independent film. It was an independent film that like got bought out right before we started shooting. So it right. really was an indie, yeah. But, but like, you know, the studios aren't taking many risks anymore. No, it's all these big blockbuster, everything's tentpole. What do you feel about that as far as, you know, just for the creativity of, of unique stories, unique voices in those stories? What do you think? You know, there are still places that are making those things. And so it's not Disney, it's not Columbia, but there's still the Annapurna's, the mm -hmm. A24's. I think we still have a really vibrant indie film community. And so those, those movies are, are happening and they're still getting seen. I think the biggest shift that we're seeing is that more of those movies are ending up on Netflix, on Amazon, on Apple, on places that aren't, you know, that aren't, you know, going into a, a big giant movie theater and seeing it there. Um, I love the big screen movie experience and I still want to keep making those movies, but I have to be realistic that there's certain kinds of movies for which most people are expecting to see it, you know, through a streaming service. And maybe we should just acknowledge expectation and make those things for the, those markets because that's where you're going to see, um, like always be my maybe worked really well for Netflix. Um, and that's everyone could watch it and it could be a part of a cultural conversation because it was so successful there on Netflix, if it had come out and done the traditional, you know, platform in New York, Los Angeles, and have to expand out from that, I don't know if it would have worked. So I think that's just where we're at right now.
What do you think of the whole streaming service phenomenon, or the Netflix effect, as they say? Like yeah. it has, it is literally. I mean, this little small company completely changed the way yeah. Hollywood does business. Yeah, I mean, for certain kinds of projects, you know, they are a huge dominant player. And you know, as someone who's writing things, you always want more buyers. You always want more <laughs> places where things can go. That's that's sure. just the reality. So it's it's amazing to have them there as another big studio, um, but. The, the downsides are, you know, it used to be you'd make a movie and it would exist out there in the world and you could always find it. Or you, there was a DVD, that, there was just a sense that like there was a movie was a physical thing. And now that it's just bits on a streaming service and you right. just don't know what's going to happen to it, it's great that everyone in the world can see your movie. But in some ways, there's so much there that it's very hard to sort of point somebody to your movie and get them watching it. And it's hard, honestly, the the aftermarket for a movie is so much smaller now just because it, it it's showing up on a streaming service and there's no there's residuals but they're not the same kind of residuals that writers got used to now what is your approach to structure and how and how do you structure your scripts in, in general like do you outline i'm not a big outliner um but i have a very good sense generally when i'm starting writing of what the the important beats are and most importantly where I'm headed. So it's like a road trip. Like I know, obviously you know where you're starting, but you gotta have a really good sense of like where you want to end up and you could take some different routes to get there, but you have to have a good sense of like, okay, this is getting me towards where I want to be. So I'm, you know, if it's New York to Los Angeles, I could go by the Grand Canyon or I could go by Mount Rushmore. I have to make some choices, but I will get to that place where I'm going. So I have a good sense of the big, you know, pit stops along the way as I'm, as I'm getting there. I'm not a, a huge believer in, you know, page 30, page 60, page 90, mm -hmm. sort of these are the big moments we have to hit. All movies begin, all movies have a middle point and they have an end. It's just naturally, everything has a beginning and an end. Um, but I don't believe in sort of the strict, you know, ideas of like, you know, that a three act structure has to hit exactly these moments. Do you, like, there's a lot of these rules that you hear about, like, you know, make sure there's not a lot of uh, action. Like you need a lot of white space on the script and, mm -hmm proper formatting and, and and of course that's part of the yeah. process but how truly important like if you have a, if you have one typo on your script are you is your thing going to get thrown out no you know, not at all that's no. that's stuff that they tell people and i always tell them like look if it if you threw pulp fiction down <laughs> yeah. you know it, if you're a typo or two they're going to let you go here's here's what i think is true about that though is that the commitment to read a script is a pretty significant commitment. You're asking mm. for an hour, two hours of somebody's time and really their focus and attention. And so you have to make them believe it's really gonna be worth their time to finish the script. And so if you're giving them any excuse to put it down, then you've shot yourself in the foot. So that's why, yeah. you know, you know, ch you know, one last check for typos, one last check for like, is this really the best way through this scene? Did I mess up these characters' names? Like, is there, those last things are those last looks are very important because you know it could be somebody's only look so you want to make sure that all that stuff is done right in terms of what it looks like on the page you know i make highland 2 which is a really good screenwriting app and most of them can do the basic formatting stuff for you so that's not an issue but you're still going to have to make choices about you know how dense you want your page like how do you make it inviting for someone to get all the way through that page and flip it and, and go to the next one and i'm a person who doesn't like big blocky texts of chunk a big chunky blocks of text because i just know sometimes as a reader i'll start skimming and you just don't want people to start skimming on you so the so tighter the better as always as they say yeah i mean you don't don't put more than you need but you are the only person who can know what you really need now what advice do you have for building interesting characters because i think there's you know there's char there's char character driven uh, movies and plot driven movies uh, would you agree on that to a certain extent? Uh, to some extent. There, there's certain, certainly movies where the unique character conflicts are not what makes you buy the ticket for a movie. It's yeah, like, like, Indi like Indiana Jones, James Bond, basically. Yeah, but Indiana, I mean, Indiana Jones without Indiana Jones himself and sort of his unique yeah. thing wouldn't work. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, in other words, the plot wouldn't move if you threw another character in there. It has to Absolutely. be. Absolutely. It's an Indiana. And Absolutely. same thing with well, James Bond, you kind of maybe could do Born Identity. Yeah. Kind of. But I mean, but, but, I mean, even in his blankness, um, Jason Bourne is a fascinating character because you, 
you're leaning in to see because you don't know who he doesn't know who he is and you don't know who he is, but you're fascinated to find out. So you're on the journey with him. So what advice um, do you, what do you have advice do you have for building interesting characters? Well, I think it's tailoring the right character for the world and the story you want to tell. So it, basically you have to have a sense of what is the point of, of the story that I'm telling? Like what is, you know, be it sort of more of a plot engine or be it a world you're building, you know, as, figure out what that central question is, that thing that the movie is grappling with and figure out who is the most interesting person to be driving the story, to be carried through the story, you know, who is either best prepared for it or least prepared to go into the story. So Indiana Jones, he's uniquely well qualified to be in the story, but Groundhog Day, Bill Murray is uniquely disqualified to be in that movie. And that's what makes it so fascinating. You could do that same plot mechanic with nearly any other person on earth, but this grumpy weatherman is a really great fit for the story you're trying to tell. And was there ever a movie like Groundhog's Day prior to Groundhog's Day that did that? There were movies that, um, yeah, there were movies that that, that repeated time. time. They repeated time. Yeah, that was not a first thing. So, like, I mean, Rashomon goes back to the same moment three times. So. Yeah, but yeah, I guess it, but, it so does. So not, not caught in a time loop this quite the same way. But like sure. that idea is not new to Groundhog Day. It's what, but and that's an important thing to stress is like there are no ideas that are groundbreakingly new. It's execution that matters. And it was the execution of that, you know, that time loop thing, which could have been in any Twilight Zone, but with a comedic bent, with a very specific character, with a very specific moral lesson he has to learn. That's what makes Groundhog Day Groundhog Day. Is there any film that you can think of in recent history uh, or even in your lifetime that you saw like, wow, that is completely original. That is completely new. I've never seen or heard anything like that. I don't, I don't like the final movie nearly as much as the script, but Natural Born Killers for me was, mm. as a script, something that was, um, it was just so inventive with form. And it, do, it doesn't all translate into the final movie, but um, it was the first script I remember reading where I finished it and just flipped back to page one and started reading again because you know, like, it would just suddenly become a sitcom, kind of for no reason, but it would, be, <laughs> it, it would, just, it would just change its form. And it, it seemed to be aware that, it was, that we were in a time of you know, post postmodernism, there's like the boundaries between media forms were eroding. And so Tarantino's original script for that, I thought was so groundbreaking and original that I just, I just loved it. I would love to see that version produced. Like if he actually, Oh my God, it'd be, it would be amazing. It'd be fantastic. Yeah. And I'm a fan of the, of the movie. I never, I've read, I saw the movie first before I read the, the script, yeah. but then when I read the script, I'm like, Oh, this, this is completely different. <laughs> completely yeah. different situation no, it was it was remarkable when you when like who is like one of your favorite like you know favorite screenwriters like who do you look at and go man well everyone in my generation who started writing when we did i mean we all look up to james cameron for his ability to write action on the page and so you know many of us are still kind of consciously or subconsciously aping sort of what he's able to do because it was minimalist but fantastic and you really give you a sense of being present in that moment for the action that's happening. Um, Nora Ephron, her ability to sort of um, just illuminate characters from within and, and just and just have a really good sense of like how the ball passes back and forth. James L. Brooks, again, a great example of a writer who can, um, you know, make people feel grounded and real in, in their place in their world, but he's also telling you a story. He's 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 constructing a universe that's going to force them as the characters to make choices. So, I mean, just to pick three off the top of my head, those are three that I would go back to. Now, we, we touched upon this a little earlier to, uh, today, but the protagonist, the, um, or excuse me, the antagonist, the, the villains of, the, there is yeah. a problem, there's a disease of bad villains out in, the, <laughs> in yeah. cinema. What do you, what advice would you have for, to create a really good villain? And can you give an example of two or three, like insanely good villains? You're like, well, that's the depth that those villains had, you know? Uh, let's think about it. So, obviously, the best villains don't understand that they're villains. They every villain is a hero, and so sure. the best villains think that they are doing what needs to be done, and they have they have very good reasons for why they're doing it, whether they're moral reasons or other reasons. Um, some villains I've especially loved: Tilda Swinton's character in um, uh, Michael Claiborne. And Michael Claiborne. Um, I'm messing up the title. The, the George Clooney movie. Um, yes, 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 yes. I know who you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, I remember. Uh, the, yeah. Michael Clayton. Michael Clayton, thank you. Uh, uh, she's fantastic in that she is, she's weak in really fascinating ways. I, I love that she's 
you know, she's ballsy and tough, but she's also vulnerable in ways that you don't often see villains. And so I thought it was a brilliant characterization there. I think Tony Gilroy, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's the screenwriter there. Um, other villains I love. I mean, one of my favorite movies of all time is Aliens. And mm. uh, the alien queen, you don't think of it as being a character, but its motivations are so clean and pure. Um, and that's a movie that's all constructed around sort of the horror of motherhood. It's it's Ripley, <laughs> as, Ripley as a mother, like Ripley playing surrogate a mother, mother role that she wasn't yeah. expecting, a surrogate mother to Newt, and you know the alien queen as the evil version of of that mother um, are just they're brilliantly balanced between the two of them. And so I think in the movies that I love, you see that oh that is exactly the right villain or antagonist to challenge this specific hero or protagonist in the story. Um, so like a mirror, they, like a mirror yeah. image, like a mirror image uh, of, of like, so I always use Batman and the Joker, like they're yeah, yeah. literally polar opposites and they're perfect for each other. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, the Joker is a fantastic villain in all different incarnations. It's, it's, whether it's a, he's a force of pure chaos or a force of um, just, a, a just twisted love. There's, there's lots of ways to play the Joker, but I think it's easy, you know, iconic for all those reasons. Um, I do a series of books called Arlo Finch. So they're middle grade fictions or Harry Potter age fiction. And it's been fascinating, like trying to find the right villain for that because the central character is a 12 year old boy who's like um, nervous about things. He's, he's a big planner. He's, he's sort of, you know, always a little bit leery of, of the world outside there. And finding the right villain opposite him has been fascinating. So I needed to end up finding a character through who was um, Arlo ended up creating his own villain. And so quite accidentally, like he was trying to do the right thing, but ended up sort of creating this madman who ended up coming back after him. Um, and so when characters and when antagonists and protagonists have that causal bond between the two of them, I think that's especially meaningful. Superman has that with Lex Luthor because, you know, Superman accidentally, you know, got accidentally hurt Lex Luthor as a kid. Those things are great. In Big Fish, the protagonist antagonist relationship is between the father and the son and so yeah. the they're each other's villain and each other's hero and um and that's a fun way to look at it as, t as well now as far as uh the protagonist what makes a good like what makes you want to jump on board with that protagonist and go on that journey because there's also some weak weak motivations and so yeah. many so many screenplays and also movies that i see just like man i don't care about that guy like i don't yeah, i don't want to go on this journey i don't care about this person um, or, or it's just so flimsy, the reasoning, it's just kind of like someone just threw something in there just to get it to the next step. What's yeah. your, what's your opinion? What, what's what well, When you're talking you about off? motivation, you're, when you talk about motivation, you're really just a synonym for want and like all mm -hmm. characters want things, but the protagonist in the movie, we want what the protagonist wants. And if we don't want what the protagonist wants, then we don't, we don't care. We won't follow that person in the movie. So it's establishing really early on what it is that the, um, your central character wants needs and fears so we understand why we're going on this journey with the character and for movies that's really like is this a journey that we're willing to spend about two hours with this character and see them go from this point to that point and it'd be a big transformation that's what makes movies so different than tv shows is that movies are about a one-time experience you, it's the characters profoundly change versus a tv show they're not going to change a lot by the end of the episode so you're you're looking for like who is the right character who can change, who can protagonate over the course of two hours to get to a really meaningful emotional place that they couldn't have got to earlier on. Um, and that's, you know, it's looking then along the way for how do you, you know, put choices in front of the char this character so that we see why he or she is doing what they're doing and can never go back to the places that they were before. I wanted to touch on something, uh, and I think you're uniquely qualified to answer this uh, because a lot of a lot of not only filmmakers but screenwriters as well. They and I was I was guilty of this as well early on in my career that you're trying to kind of hack your way into Hollywood. You're trying to mm -hmm. hack your way into getting an agent or getting in through the back door or using this technique or this 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 little secret that you heard someone say once. Can you kind of? Just debunk that and understand, yeah. like, you know, you do need quality, but mm -hmm. um, there is right place, right time, right product, you know, yeah. without without question. Yeah. I mean, you need you need to be a good writer. And you need to be lucky. <laughs> and right. 
um, you can work on becoming a good writer and you can work on being on getting lucky by making sure that your stuff is out there where people can find it because no one's going to stumble across your script if they have no way to find your script. So a lot of the questions I'm getting is like, oh, I, I want to send my, the script over to somebody, but I'm worried about it getting stolen or something like getting past those fears is the first thing you have to do because you want anybody under the sun who wants to read your script to read your script because you never know who is the person that's going to spark for in the right way that will they'll start the ball rolling into the next thing. Um, I wasn't a big part of any writers groups, but I know a lot of people who are working right now who are you know, sort of on the early levels who have found get it, the accountability of being in a writers group and having every week to show up with like, this is the new thing I wrote, this is the thing I did, is great. And then as some people develop some traction, um, it's, it's a way to sort of get your stuff out there into the world. So especially if you're in Los Angeles, joining a group of, of, of good writers whose opinions you like and trust and who you can really contribute to, to that group is probably a good idea as well. Do you have any advice for people trying to just, uh, you know, play the, the Hollywood game, if it's lack of a better word? Is there, I mean, is there any tips? Yeah, I mean, there's always, I, there's always been a Hollywood game. The rules change some degree, but like, <laughs> day, it, it's, but you can spend all your time just playing that game and you'll right. never get anything made. And that's, that's good the choice. issue. And so, I mean, it is important. I mean, there's a, there's a social aspect to what we do um, mm -hmm. in that you have to be able to, you would think like, oh, I'm a really, if you're a good writer, then it shouldn't matter that I, I can't sort of like pitch in a room. But no, you got to be able to pitch in a room. It's like it's part of the sport that you're, you're, you're playing. Um, you've got to learn how to be able to sort of just like function at a, you know, cocktail party and, you know, and make that chit chat stuff because that will be an important function of it all. And understanding, and with those social skills, as you're starting to work on stuff, understanding the notes you're getting and sort of the, what's behind the notes and how to sort of, you know, figure out what you actually need to do versus what you should ignore. That those are all important skills and they're hard to cultivate until you actually are just doing them and um, you're going to be stressed out at times. And that's just the reality. Now, how do you deal with notes? Because I mean, you you're working at the the highest levels in Hollywood, and you're dealing with uh, you know a lot of studios and studio executives and directors and, lack of a better term, egos uh, as well, uh, actors' wants and needs. So, how do you deal with notes coming in from you at all at all angles? You know, it's that balance of being humble and sort of like understanding that like this is a, a collaborative thing that you're trying to do, and so you're going to have to be able to. You may have your one perfect vision for how this is supposed to be, but like that one perfect vision is useless if they can't make that perfect vision, if they can't see the movie that's in your head. So it's hearing what they're saying, processing it in ways that make sense to you, trying to echo it back and do the things that make sense so you can come to a consensus about the same kind of movie you're trying to make. Um, it's tough. And I would say that one of the, the I don't know if it's a crisis, but one of the real challenges facing screenwriting right now is that uh, it's still kind of playing by the, the way it's always played, where there's, there's this conservatism, there's this play it safe aspect, there's this, you know. Fear. Like, fear, yeah. And there's much less fear in television. There's much less fear in sort of like the um, the good television being made and the writers are just being able to make the choices. Why, they, why is that? Because the budgets are, are massive as well. But they are, I think there's just a recognition that, um, that ultimately there's going to be differences of opinions, but the, the writer who's responsible for that whole series, you got to, got to listen to what she's saying and that she may actually know what she's talking about. I'm not saying it's perfect and like network TV is still a drag, but the folks I know who are working in television now are finding, um, even when they get noted, they're getting noted to like, Let's make this smarter rather than let, let's sand off the rough edges. Now, you, you talking about pitching earlier. Do you have any tips on pitching? Because pitching is a, a completely different skill set to walk yeah, into it that is. room. And it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of practice. I mean, the spirit for a pitch, though, is you have to think about, imagine you just saw a movie you absolutely loved and you had to convince your best friend to go see that movie. And so you wouldn't pitch every beat of it. You would pitch the, the world, the principal characters, what it's about, you'd get us into it, and but then you would sort of shorthand some things along the way. And most importantly, you'd really share your enthusiasm for it, that it's not just, you're not just going through a list of bullet points, that it really feels like you are selling the movie, not just telling the movie. Now, 
what um, what is your daily writing routine like? So I'm here in my office. Um, I I'm usually out here by nine a.m. I'm here nine to six, but I'm I yeah you know, I'm twenty feet away from my house, so I can I can wander back in. I know the feeling. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I can I can go in and out pretty freely. I try to get three hours of writing done a day, and so I usually do those as sprints. And so people who follow me on Twitter can see like. I'm saying I'm about to start a write sprint. Who wants to join me? I usually start a sprint at the top of the hour. Mm. So like at 10 a.m. I'm starting this, and that means for 60 minutes I'm doing nothing but writing. And in Highland 2, we have a little timer function. So it, it, it starts and it's counting my words that I do within that hour. So, And then when that hour is up, then I can step away. But like during that hour, I'm not Googling things. I'm just focusing on getting words on paper. Or, deep or deep the, work, deep writing, deep if work. you will. Yeah, I'm really, really writing. And then if I do three of those a day, I'm getting enough done that things will get finished. For a book, I'm hitting at least a thousand words a day. For a script that's three to five, maybe seven pages, um, you'll finish if you if you get that much done. And and there is kind of like a a, a disease of distractions that we have to deal with as as oh, yeah. just human beings in general, but as writers, as creatives. Uh, it's so brutal because you have little yeah. dings, you have little notifications, all that stuff. The concept of deep work, I don't know if you read that book, Deep Work, which is yeah. ama- it's an amazing book about just what you can get done if you actually just focus. Yeah, yeah, you should. yeah. You know, any tips on how to deal with, the, you know, what you know, do you do? You just block everything use, out? Yeah, I used to use this um, app called Freedom, which like blocks your internet connection. <laughs> yeah. And like, that's great if it works. I found just, you know, actually starting the timer and just like saying 60 minutes, is enough for me. Like I, it'll keep me on task. But everyone's different. So recognizing that what works for somebody else may not be the right solution for you, but there probably is a solution for you. And this is this is my version of it. Mm-hmm. The other thing I will say is that I've never been one to write in sequence, and so I will write whatever scene appeals to me to write that day. And so I'm, I, I let myself freely hop around because when you're making a movie, when you're editing a movie, you're going to be doing that naturally anyway. So just. Mm-hmm. Um, don't give yourself the excuse of like, well, I don't really know how to do this next scene. Then like, well, then don't do that scene. Do the other scene that you need that you actually have the energy to do. Because there's times where I feel like writing a big action sequence and there's times where I just want to have, you know, some happy bantery dialogue between some characters. Recognizing what you want to write that day is an important part of it. And how do you get through writer's block or do you, have you ever suffered through writer's block? I've had very little of that sort of classic image of like the, the writer, the typewriter, and pulling it out and crumbling it up in like a little, the, <laughs> the montage of the the, the wastebasket <laughs> pulling up the, the paper balls. I don't have a lot of that. Um, I do have procrastination. I have mm, um, yeah. this self doubt of like, is this even the right idea? Is this even worth it? Um, deadlines can help. Uh, you know, taking a step back and really looking at why I want to write a project can help. You know, this is not a thing I I particularly do, but. I, I know friends who at the start of a project will write themselves a letter saying like, this is why I'm so excited to write this thing. They'll seal it up and like set it there. And so then whenever they need that, they can rip over the envelope. It's like, oh, that's right. This is the thing that I've done. That's why I've started doing this. One thing I try to do at the start of a project is make a playlist in iTunes of these are all the songs that remind me of this movie. So there's songs that could be in the movie, but just at least feel like it. And so I can get myself emotionally back in that space of like, Oh, that's right. This is what the movie feels like. Um, so, in those times where it's hard to get started, I can at least get my brain moving in the right direction. Did Did you ever feel, uh, even early on, or even later on in your career, that imposter syndrome, that self doubt oh, yeah. that you had to that had to break through? What did you do to break through that? Because I know so many artists, if not every single artist ever, um, has dealt with that at one point in their career. Well, it's a byproduct of something that's very necessary to do, which is fake it till you make it like fake, like, you know what you're doing until you actually are doing the job. And then, uh, everyone's like, Oh, you're doing the job. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, but the imposter syndrome you say is the natural sort of, you know, progression carry on after that. Yeah. Like, wait, wait, I was faking it. And now everyone believes I actually know what I'm doing. And at a certain point you recognize like, I, I do know what I'm doing or I actually do, you know, I have the answers to these questions. Um, it does, never entirely goes away. And I think there's something actually lovely about in, imposter syndrome is that as I've moved into new areas, and so as I did my first Broadway musical, as I started writing software, as I started you know, writing songs, uh, you, know, you know, podcasting, 
I didn't always exactly know what I was doing. And it's kind of great to be a beginner because it gives you the excuse to be, you know, to make mistakes and just, you know, also reminds you of like what it's like to be young. So I think part mm -hmm. of the reason why even having done this for 20 plus years, I still have a good connection to sort of like what it's like to start is because I'm always starting new kinds of things. I'm always, you know, being new in a, in a place and I know how exciting, but how disorienting that can be. It is terrifying to start something new sometimes, especially yeah. as you get older, as you get older, you yeah. become less fearless. I mean, when you were young, you would do things that you were, well, we do stupid things. Let's yeah. be honest. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I have to acknowledge that like, I have the privilege of like, I started making a good living pretty early on. So, mm -hmm. and I, so I, I didn't, I wasn't risking everything at every moment to, to right. try a new thing. It's like, I could always kind of fall back on what I'd done before. And so not everyone's going to have that, but particularly people who are just starting out, like if you're in your early twenties and you just moved to Los Angeles, you're kind of used to living on ramen. So like you can, you can take some bigger risks in your twenties and you should. Now, um, I wanted to ask you really quickly about subtext because it's something yeah. that's it's also another virus that goes throughout screenplays, writing on the nose and so on. Any insights you have on how you write uh, subtext? You know, I don't think if you're thinking about writing subtext, then you're probably doing it wrong. Um, okay. I said, like subtext should be just it's all the unspoken things that are happening between two characters or the feeling that you're trying to communicate um, without actually saying those words. Um, if you're worried that writing is too on the nose and that people are sort of speaking their subtext, maybe you're right, but maybe you're also just being too hard on yourself. Maybe just, I would say, take a break, listen to how some actual people talk in the world around you, and you realize that um, subtext is always happening there. There's always some shading um, being given on any things that people are saying in the real world. Um, movie dialogue is a slightly optimized version of real speech. It's sort of, mm -hmm. I always think about it, it's like a movie dialogue is what people would say if they had an extra... 10 or 15 seconds between the, the ball being hit back. It's like they just hit it back a little bit better than they otherwise <laughs> normally would. Right. And we forgive them of that. It's when they, things feel so crafted that then it becomes kind of arch and either it's great and you're, you're Aaron Sorkin or it feels really, really right. forced. And so it really is a, a genre expectation. Now, uh, let's talk about Highland for a little bit. You yes. have this amazing piece of software called Highland, which is a screenwriting piece, uh, screenwriting yeah. software. And now yeah. you have a new version coming out. So can you tell everybody about the software uh, and what the new things are in 2.5? So Highland originally came about because this is a situation I'm sure you've encountered too, where you get a PDF of a script and you need to edit something. Like you, you oh. can't edit a PDF. Yeah, it's and brutal. so back in the day, we'd have to, re have to retype it. So the original Highland was just an app to melt down a PDF. So it could take a PDF and make it an editable document again. And so we had that and it's like, you know what? This, this raw text, I wish I could just stay in this raw text and not have to deal with all of the bullshit of Final Draft. Because Final Draft was a genius program when all we had was Microsoft Word. We had to write scripts in Word. And so like Final Draft seemed just like a godsend. But all of the metaphors of Final Draft are very 1990s. Mm -hmm. And... The, 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 that you have to, I mean, it kind of still looks like it's in the 90s, but like that you have to tell Final Draft what every single element on the page is. Like, oh, this is a character name. This is a parenthetical. This is dialogue. Mm -hmm. This must be a transition. Um, that you have to just keep hitting that dumb tab key or the reformat thing to, to tell us like, no, this is what I'm trying to do. And so when I started working with that raw text, it's like, well, this is actually just so much better. If I could just go back from this raw text and then get a nice looking you know, PDF at the end of it, I'd be delighted. And so we made the app to do that. So it's just... You're just typing it like you would type an email, but it understands what you're doing. So it understands that like, oh, that uppercase word that has another line below it, that must be a character name and some dialogue. Oh, there's parentheses? I bet that's a parenthetical. That line ends in T-O colon? I bet that's a transition. And it just, our computers are smart enough we can figure out what this stuff is. Right. And so the app began as a way to, to do screenwriting in that really plain text way. And then we just... I added in the things as a writer that I wanted most in an app. And so things like, as a screenwriter, you're always, there's little bits of text that you don't have a place for, but you don't want to lose them. So you're cutting them, but you, I would, I'd make a scratch file and paste it over in the scratch file in case I ever needed that thing again. In Highland, you just drag it over to the side. There's a little thing called a bin. It just sits in your bin. So it's more like editing you know, video, where it's just like, you have a bin of all your little clips and you can just like bring stuff back in. Mm -hmm. I'd want to take those metaphors, bring it through. Um, the, the big thing we did with Highland 2.5 
was adding in revision mode because as a screenwriter, you're often working, you know, as you're going from one draft to the next draft, you want to put those little stars in the margins to show like what's mm -hmm. changed. And if you've ever done that in Final Draft or any of those other apps, Painful. it's incredibly complicated. You're just like, you know, it looks like you're landing the space shuttle when you try to turn on that mode. <laughs> and I was like, it should not have to be that way. So in, in, in Highland 2.5, it's just a little, you just flip a switch and tell it what color you want to be. And like, it just does it. And so we hit all the complexity behind under the hood. So it's just really simple. And you can just start typing and you see like, oh, as long as the switch is flipped, everything I type now is going to be blue and there's going to be stars in the margins. And you would so, think you would think that would be already there. It's just so simple. <laughs> yes. Um, but no, no, another app was doing it that way. And even like track changes in a word, if you ever had to do that, oh my God, it's complicated. You can mess up a document so badly. So mm -hmm. we just wanted it to be simple and simple in a way that people would actually use it. And so that's what we were able to do with this. Very cool. And then and you started Highland in general just because you were like, I, I'm, yeah. I, I just can't take this anymore. I, I wanted a better thing. I, I'm going to be in an app for you know eight hours a day. It should be a beautiful app that I, I'm really comfortable in. So I'm, you know, my company makes it, but I'm also the principal beta tester for it because every day I'm launching a new build that has some small things fixed or changed or we're seeing like, well, what if it did this? What if it did that? And it can't crash because I'm writing all this stuff in it. So it, it, it has to be rock solid so that I can use it every day. So uh, it's a unique challenge for my designer and for my coder, but you know, I want the app that works best for me and happens to work best for most of the people I end up showing it to. And how long has it been around? So Highland 2 came out last year, almost a year ago, and uh, we had small revisions, but this 2.5 release is a big release, a big set of changes for, um, for sort of for everyone. I would, should say that one of the fundamental things we, we did differently in, in Highland versus other apps is in Word and in Final Draft, there's that sense of like what you see is what you get. So like you're always typing in sort of the final form of things in Highland. You're, you work in an editor and you preview and you sort of see what what it's like. It's like it renders out sort of what the final version is. And it's just, it ends up being a much faster workflow. You're not fiddling with little bits of things because you're just focused on the words, not the formatting around it. Very cool. Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all of my guests. Please. What advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Uh, I'm going to restate something I said earlier in the podcast is that, um, Focus on writing that thing you wish existed in the world. And so, I mean, really for any artist, but like, so for a screenwriter, write the script of the movie you wish you could see. And that's the one you'll finish. That's the one you'll keep fighting for. That's the one you'll be enthusiastic. And that enthusiasm will really be seen in the, the work itself. So just last night I was talking to a guy who's like, I really want to do this big mythology project, but I'm worried there's not gonna be a market for it. I'm like, oh my God, what a, that's, that's ridiculous you really want to make this, write this movie. So you should write this movie. Like, why are, why are you standing up here talking to me? Like go off and write that movie. Um, so people I think have this sense of you need to ask permission and mm -hmm. don't ask permission. Just write the thing you want to write. It's the best thing about writing is it's free. Like you don't have to have a crew. You don't have to camera. You don't have to anything. Just like, just, just do just a copy of Highland, thing. a copy of Highland and a copy laptop. Of it's free. It's free to download on the Mac <laughs> app store. There's really nothing uh, in your way. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? Which book? Let's see. Well, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which I read in third grade, um, we had this assignment where we had to, we were learning how to write proper letters, where it's like, dear person's name and date in the corners, a couple of paragraphs, and sincerely. And I wrote my letter to Roald Dahl, who wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We sent it all the way over to England, and he sent me a postcard back. Um, and it was still like a form postcard, but it said, dear John. It was the first time that I realized like, oh, authors are actual real people. And it got me thinking like, maybe I could be an author. And so uh, so I wouldn't say, like, I love the book. I'm not saying it's like the single greatest piece of literature, but like my connection to it uh, really did start me on the journey. Now, what, what, what was that like when you got the call or you got the, the final approval to, to redo, you know, to write? Yeah, it was amazing. When I sat down with Tim that first time to talk through it, like I brought my card because I still have the postcard for uh, that rolled all sent me back. So uh, and it felt like, you know, it felt very movie-like in that, like, you know, this, right. this, this circle had been completed. Yes, the circle of life, if you will, almost. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? I would say that 
I had a lot of things that for years I said like, oh, these are my bad habits. And I started to rec just recognize that they're just my habits. It's just like, it's how I work. It's how my brain works. And so I procrastinate. I, you know, make some things harder for myself than I necessarily need to. But that's just, that, that's just who I am. That's just, just, those are just my habits. And it's, when I stopped looking at them through a negative lens and just said like, that's just, yeah, that's how I, that's how I do it. Um, things got better. Now, what did you learn from your biggest failure? Um, I was trying to think what my biggest failure would be. Uh, <laughs> I, I, wanna, I would say I learned a little more humility in the sense of, you know, that in wanting to control everything and wanting to sort of, um, have dominion over like a whole, a whole project and sort of getting it to work a certain way. Um, there were always going to be things I couldn't control and mm -hmm. that, you know, you can't control how people react to a thing. You can't control how, um, stuff works. And so all you can try to make, all you can try to do is make sure the daily process of working on the thing is meaningful to you. Cause that doesn't mean it's always going to be a joy or be, um, happy but that you feel like, okay, this is, this is worth my time that, that I'm putting into it because ultimately you don't know that you're going to have anything at the end of it other than the time you put into it. And what is the biggest fear you had to overcome when writing your first screenplay? Um, really like kind of the format, uh, cause the screenplay format is just really weird. When you first start looking at it, it looks, it looks just sort of arcane. So I kept worried that I was going to make some fundamental mistake, which would make my thing unfilmable. Mm. And, um, I didn't really quite get over it until we were in production on go and I realized like, Oh yeah, that scene I write, I wrote, we just shot it and it's done and it's fine. So like that, the translation of these words on paper and that's scene that's down in the camera, um, that it could really happen. So it was that fear that like, it's sort of an imposter syndrome too. Like they're going to find out that I, that I really don't know what I'm doing. And three of your favorite films of all time. So I think we talked about some of them. So Aliens is, oh, so is right good. up there. So good. I mean, just I mean, Alien the movie is fantastic. Like but to, Alien to, is to make a, a sequel delight. to a masterpiece like Alien. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. And, and and again, that's a case of recognizing what the source of material is, but also what you want to say and you know what unique thing you have to bring to a piece of material. So um, it's not a remake, but it's you know every sequel has to ask, answer the question, like, why are we doing this again? And it, it answered it really, really well. Clueless, um, Amy Heckerling's movie, it's just amazing. It's yeah. so smartly done. And it, it's, you know, it's a remake of, it's an adaptation of Emma. And so it had really good bones underneath it, but it was just so amazing and specific. And then Talented Mr. Ripley, mm -hmm. um, just because it's a movie that, like, I can't believe got made um, it's <laughs> in just the studio this, system. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's expensive and it's weird and it's dark and I just love it. I just love it to death. So those would be three of my favorites. And where can people find uh, you and, and the work, your podcast, all that kind of good Great. stuff. So um, I have a website. It's just John August.com uh, Twitter. I'm at John August, Instagram at John August script notes. You can find through John August.com or we're on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. John, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Absolutely. A pleasure it's, for me too. Thank you so much for dropping some good knowledge bombs on the tribe today. So thank you again.